Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Conquer the Clutter podcast. This being the 19th, we are midway through July, um, and I hope you're having um, as great weather as we're having. So it's good to see so many people here right out of the gate, right at 11 o'clock. That's great. And despite the fact uh, that this is holiday season, so yay you. Um, Today, we're going to talk about something that is very important. Um, It is common misconceptions concerning hoarding. And the reason that it's so important is that there are so many misconceptions, and I hear them regularly. Um, I thought it was worth the time um, and effort to put this together in a two podcast series, because I believe after, if anything has taught me, if I've learned anything in the last 22 years of specializing and working with individuals who hoard and their families, um, it is that if you're going to put the effort personally into something, or you're going to help someone else, it's really important to be doing it based on facts, right? And not based on well-intentioned, much repeated, misguided beliefs. So I don't want to see you um, have a legacy of putting a lot of emotion, a lot of hope into the efforts that you're making on your behalf about clutter and find that the foundation you were working on wasn't sound. All right. So it can be misguided beliefs or it can be accurate beliefs, but completely out of the context of your current life's situation that you're actually living right now, all right? So remember, context is everything. Nothing is true out of its context. When we give power and energy to beliefs that are misguided because they were formed as a result of a completely different time place and person that we were or other people were at a minimum all right what we're doing is we're marching in place like a rat on a wheel that's a waste of energy and hope rather than making the progress that you're trying to make I'm trying to help you make putting good faith your own good faith behind Uh, the information you get at the podcast, information that you gather from other sources, but also these misconceptions. And together with good faith, there's a lot of positive energy that you need to summon up and hope, all right? Um, Hope um, is what drives um, our passion to have a better situation for ourselves or someone else. So today's podcast is just an effort to help whoever needs to needs the help to refocus and to actually recontextualize some of the beliefs that you or they may have and therefore may be working from. All right, because those misguided perceptions and beliefs are not going to get you or them where everyone needs to be. Okay, so the first misconception, and boy, I think you've all heard this one because it I hear it every week somehow, all right? Uh, so hoarding is somehow associated with either having gone through the Great Depression or having parents or grandparents that did. Sorry, folks, not so. All right. It sounds logical, but it isn't. It's not factual. Many, I say millions conservatively, many, 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 probably hundreds of millions of people who don't hoard all lived through the depression or had parents who did or grandparents that did. In fact, the vast majority of the people who lived through these generations didn't hoard and they don't hoard now. They're still alive. I want you to look at two concepts about hoarding, right? And the distinction is is, um, a fine one, but it's a very important one. Uh, 
And it's important for all of us to understand, especially important if you're the one who's caught in the clutter vortex, okay? Because all you're going to do is spin based on an unsound foundation. There is such a thing as adaptive hoarding. All right. Adaptive hoarding is when people acquire and keep a supply of things. It can be a considerable number of things because they actually know based on their personal history that they will, here's that word again, actually use them. All right. It's not, a, I believe, possibly it's their behavior has proved over time repeatedly and consistently that the abundance of buying is something that they are going to use and they're going to do it no matter what they're stocking up on, all right? They're going to do it because these are things that are part of their everyday life. And most importantly, not only will they use them, they will use them before the items reach the expiration date or otherwise deteriorate, all right? That's the most important concept, all right, in the previous two sentences, actually. Why are they able to keep a supply of items and actually use them in time? Because they, like you, may have personal values or a commitment not to waste. And they, here's the key word, they action that personal value. And they action it with effective behaviors, beha effective behaviors and effective choices that they make every day. All right. They, they aren't any different from you, except they have brackets around the concept of it's a good thing to have more of this because whatever reason. They may have uh, emotional beliefs. They may be in, uh, committed to intensive recycling. Ditto, they're committed to a personal value that is effective because along with the value and belief goes consistent behaviors. They may have a desire to be efficient by using things for alternative uses. I hear that all the time, but the difference is the quantity they acquire and they store isn't based on speculation. It's based on experience proven experience in the and and they're no better than you are they're no smarter they're no healthier they're no whatever they just have a parameter of based on real experience not hope not vague beliefs that they will they know from experience they did all right and they actually carry out those values and beliefs behaviorally and consistency, all right? Now, there may be other personal or practical reasons for their acquiring behavior, but their pattern of behavior is that things get used in the numbers acquired. I know I'm repeating that a lot, but I really want the mystery to be lifted. All right. I want to clear out the webs, the, the cobwebs in the corner there um, of, yeah, but. The, and here's the other thing that happens. When individuals hoard adaptively, and you can do this, you just need to turn up the volume a little, okay, and turn down the, the lack of context. Um, they rotate those things regularly as well, all right? The point with adaptive hoarding is that people hoard, honor the things. And they honor their own values and beliefs by carrying them out. Carrying out the purpose for which those things were acquired or kept, all right, in the first place. Bottom line, 
All right, say it one more time. They carry out their intent. Remember that every person who clutters does not necessarily go on to hoard. But conversely, all right, in the 22 years that I've specialized in working with individuals who hoard and those who care about them, every single person, here's the, here's the danger sign, every single person has told me that they started out by creating clutter. So clutter is not an indicator that you are necessarily in a hoarding situation. But if you don't deal with the clutter very innocently and very gradually, it can grow, all right? It can grow and become invisible until one day you wake up and go, when did this happen? And, and I hear that all the time, all right? Because clutter grows in a context of experiencing being overwhelmed. And overwhelmed means that that executive function part of your brain is not working for team you efficiently. It can't. It's overwhelmed, it's clogged, it's, it's struggling, all right? So the fact that you are and usually do regularly, sorry, regularly attend this podcast may mean that it's time for you personally to decide where you are on the behavioral continuum. Is it you're struggling and overwhelmed? You've got to recognize that. All right. Are you intending to do things? And OK, don't set yourself up by overestimating what is reasonable to do. All right. Don't set yourself up for failure. Are you are you identifying small chunks that you then make a priority? All right. Now, I don't want anyone doing all or nothing thinking here at this point. OK, just because you don't do the cleanup or the resolution perfectly and habitually, consistently every time. All right. That somehow you're a failure. Somehow you are less than. All right. No, it just means that. The state of being overwhelmed has got you a little bit stuck, all right? And maybe you're buying on for beliefs um, that are misconceptions. And nothing you do is even partially good enough. Anybody here feel that? If it's not done, finished, and perfect, all right, that's a recipe for using your energy um, to... Um, Injure yourself by incapacitating you. All right. Think about it. If you don't do it perfectly, then anything you do do isn't good enough. Who in their right mind would get up and start that kind of job? Okay. It's perfectly reasonable. So I want to help you get unstuck and unoverwhelmed. And to do that, I'd ask you at this point, right now, I can see Nora's already done it. Take out your pen and paper right now, okay? If that misconception about adaptive hoarding is in your mind, all right, you intend to use those things that you gather, no matter what they are, in bountiful supply, but it doesn't work out that way, I want you right now to give some serious thought. Be honest with yourself. What is your intent when you do that? Is it practical use based on experience with those items, those types of items? Or is it somewhere in the realm of fear? Like, for sure you'll have enough. It's like taking out insurance 
You ever notice that with insurance, the thing about insurance is you never actually want to use it. By the time you're using the insurance, something pretty awful has happened. All right. So don't buy things. Don't acquire things, even if they're free, based on I might. Acquire things based on I have an active plan right now. And I know that I will use these things up before they either become a pile or the nature of them is transformed in some way by, by uh, non-use. All right. Okay. So on one side of the page, on that page you're looking at right now, I want you to put what is your intent. Now, if there's more than one type of item, what is your, and, and your intent is different for different types of item, list about at least three types of items, because if there is more than one, there's probably more than three. Um, this is a good idea that is running away with you, perhaps, okay? Let's shine a light on it and understand it for what it is right now, all right? What's your intent with each one of those items? And then on the other side of the page, I want you to put down what is the biggest reason that you believe is likely to be the reason why it doesn't happen, the intent doesn't get transferred, translated rather, into action, or it doesn't happen at all, or even if it happens inconsistently, it doesn't happen consistently enough to resolve the buildup. And then those things remain and they become one of two things. They are partners in a pile that builds, all right? Or they are a pile, a gathering, a collection of things that get ruined. Hmm? Okay. And then when you've done that, everybody got their papers and pens. Everybody I can see is writing vigorously. Well done. Then I want you to circle the reason that you do that. I want you to put the reason, circle the reason. Huh? What, is your, what is your reasoning for doing it? I know your intent. But what is your reasoning for either not at all moving forward with the intent or the intent doesn't get action consistently enough that it actually ends up resulting in a pile of things that are no longer in a condition where they remain either healthy or useful. You never get to it. They may still be useful, but the next project comes in or the next idea comes in because you're a creative thinker, but you keep gathering things based on spec. Does that happen? Okay. What are you telling yourself? What's the reason? I got it for free. It was a great price. You can't have too many tins of mushroom soup. Um, it's a great price and I will share it, but I don't actually know the person I'll share it with. Um, I'd be silly not to get it at that price. Or I dickered for it. And I won. I got a deal and I... It was fun getting the deal. I, I negotiated a deal. So does it reflect some form of I won? I succeeded. Yay, I did it. Um, or does it succeed? Does it consist of something that you can't have too much? It's a safety kind of fear, 
not big fear, but just little fear that you might run out. You might run out and you'll never get it at that price again. If it has an expiry date, all right? If it has an expiry date, You've got to keep in mind the context of working reasonably within that time frame. And you can have too much toilet paper. Okay, you can have too much paper towel. You can have too much because it's occupying space that you may need for something you want to store accessibly that's part of your day-to-day life and how do you feel when you walk by it and you see all that whatever it is how do you feel what is it costing you what is it costing you when you finally have and I'm not talking monetarily it's also money because money is a resource that can avoid a lot of misery all right but What does it do to you? What does it do to your confidence, your self-esteem? What do you say to yourself when you see something and you think, gosh, now I got to throw that out? How many people have a freezer full of food and the stuff at the bottom should not be eaten, but they convince themselves that, ah, Spirey dates are just a marketing ploy. Okay, I worked at Ottawa Public Health, privileged to work at Ottawa Public Health for five years as their one lone social worker. And I worked beside the food inspection branch and the stories I heard about, ah, it's just a marketing ploy, going badly wrong. All right. Don't create a belief that isn't at least mostly based on sound fact. If you believe that, check the facts. If you keep adding to the top of the freezer, why did you buy the things at the bottom? Everybody has to face that. I have to face that. Um, To stay ahead of waste. All right. If I'd gone to the grocery store and spent that much money, or I'd gone somewhere and spent that much money, would I have done it based on it's going to be a science experiment the next time it gets hauled out into the light of day? I wouldn't. That was not my intent. Live your intent. Live your intent. You're smart people. Live your intent. And watch out for the messages on the tape or maybe integrated within yourself that talk about fear. Yeah, but what if? All right. What if? What if you'd use something else? Now, I believe that there are so many different versions that I would love, if you're willing, to put your reasons in the chat box. Because if we do that, and you will trust me with that, then I'm going to make a point to review that. And I'm going to try to make those reasons, what the foundation pieces are for those reasons, the specific topic for a future podcast, all right? Because here's the thing. The purpose of these podcasts is not to sit and listen. It's to identify the tripping hazards in our lives, some that I've had, not involving hoarding, but we all trip over something, all right? And anybody who says they don't isn't telling you the truth. All right. Or they're on really, really good medication and they don't remember it. So that those tripping hazards. In the case we're talking about generate clutter, even to the point of hoarding. Hmm? 
And then these podcasts are about doing something about it. But doing something about it based on practice and best practice and sound information. Now, there's another type of hoarding, and that is the hoarding that we generally talk about in these podcasts. That's called maladaptive hoarding. Either just intermittent enough to cause clutter to build up repeatedly that you have to struggle with, you have to lock the door, take the phone off the hook, spend a weekend reclaiming your space. Or sometimes it's even maladaptive to the point that it becomes compulsive. All right. We've got blinders on. We're chasing a something so fast and so repeatedly that we don't look back and see what we're leaving behind us. So maladaptive or compulsive hoarding, not all maladaptive has reached the point of compulsive, but it is headed that way like a freight train. All right, know that. If you're not at compulsive yet, you keep doing this without using the other part of your thinking ability and keeping an eye on living your intent. It will become compulsive. It will become almost invisible. So maladaptive or compulsive hoarding is what we're really discussing right now. Whatever the perceived intent of acquiring or saving, any kind of item that you can imagine, anything you can imagine can and is hoarded, all right? The purpose or the intent somehow breaks down. Now, on that sheet you were writing on, scrupulously, all right, on the intent side, write the intent again. Now, on the other side of the page, in another column, write down how, not why, but how it broke down. What interfered with you carrying out the intent? Can you do that? If that's too big a jump for you to clear that divide, would you make that homework for the week? All right, because that's important. Our belief is the thing we focus on. The how is the behavior that goes behind the belief. And when it's off course, you can see there's a disconnect there. All right. What behavior or lack of behavior, what perception about ourself or our worth, and it isn't all about self-worth, it could be about keeping ourselves too busy could be about a lot of things, all right? What is the behavior or lack of behavior that results in the buildup? And it results in clutter and it will go on. It will absolutely go on if we don't shine a light on it and do what we reasonably can do in small chunks. It will become a severely hoarded environment. Now, there are many reasons that this happens, and that's why I wanted to talk to each and every one of you today about it. And I want you, if you're willing, to share in the chat box. You can share directly. You don't have to share generally for everybody to see. But if I'm going to be doing future podcasts, and I am, they might as well be on something that's useful to you, right? But then you need to tell me that. It's not my job to guess. It's your job to dig down inside yourself for the answers you need and also for the ways 
behaviorally to get yourself to do those things you need. So right now, if you would have a short, true talk with yourself, what are your reasons? You don't have to justify them. You don't have to apologize for them. They are what they are. All right. But they have the jump on you right now. To the extent that there is clutter that is a problem for you in your life, they've got the jump on you. I say, let's get the jump on them because it is doable. I wouldn't do something for 22 years, six and a half days a week if it wasn't doable. It is doable, but it has to be specific to your reasons and your behaviors or lack of not closing that divide, that gap. The other thing I'd like you to ask yourself too, and maybe you just write this one down and think about it during the week. And why are those reasons consistently more important than you are? Why are they more important than your happiness, your self-esteem and your peace of mind? I want you to stop judging yourself. Stop the shame game. Stop the judgment. And I want you to be your own best friend and step outside yourself and observe. I've recently done that this week with, a, with an issue that I want of mine that I want to work with. And I want more success with it. And I'm doing it. And if I can do it, you can do it. Understanding yourself with respect, with compassion, with support, okay, is a winning behavior. It's not an excuse. To step outside yourself and be your own best friend. Because nobody knows you deeply like you know yourself. So why is something more important to do or not do that's costing you your self-esteem, your happiness, and your peace of mind? Now, right now, right this minute, as these, I, these thoughts are going around in your brain, listen to that part of yourself that is trying to tell you your truth. Your mind, your body, your spirit are always working for you in the best way they can figure out what is that part of you right now that's trying to tell you the truth and what would it take for you to have a conversation with it if you can write that down and come back to that that isn't a two-minute question but write it down Because if something has been distracting you away from that part that you already have that knows the truth about what the barrier or what the hiccup is here, you've got to be willing to slow down and listen to it. I say that in the work I do, very knowledgeable, extremely knowledgeable about hoarding, I'm very experienced at, at counseling and coaching, but the people I work with, no matter whether I work remotely, far away as China um, and Japan, all right, Tokyo, um, or they are people I go out to see, the truth is, 
inside them, they already know the answer. They just are having trouble finding it. My job is to help them drill down to find it and then to have the courage to look at it honestly. What is, what is the reason? Because there's part of you right now that's trying to tell you the truth. Just be peaceful with it after the podcast. You write it down now. Just be peaceful with it. All right. And listen, follow the trail, follow the crumbs, the breadcrumbs. All right. It doesn't come in one in one word. Usually it comes in little tiny steps that if you just have the courage to follow it and not be afraid, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen worse than what brings you to this podcast. All right, then we can get you the right help. We can, do, we can give you the right information in upcoming podcasts for you then to work on it. So let's not minimize, okay, that there are many accompanying complicating factors. There are, okay? And that makes hoarding sometimes a complicated thing to deal with. It doesn't happen for one reason. The question is, what are they for you? So from this point on, the term we are, when we use the word hoarding, we're going to be talking about maladaptive hoarding. Okay? Okay. All right. So misconception number two. Hoarding is caused by experiencing significant loss. Sometimes, but not necessarily so. Okay? Loss is part of life. And we all attribute our own meaning to the things that happen to us. I do, you do. When life takes a downturn, most people experience a sense of loss but most people don't hoard as a result. They don't allow clutter to build up to a concerning degree. They're also not, nobody in those circumstances is playing their A game. Know that. There's not anything deficient about you. There's not anything that is wrong about you. It's a response. It's a response that you need to look at. You need to understand. You need to respect. And we need to find a solution. Those who do, okay, end up creating clutter, even to the point of hoarding, might have a lower threshold for feelings of loss. Some things impact some people more acutely than others for more reasons than we have time to talk about in this podcast today. Or remember the meaning we apply to things. The meaning we apply to things, all right, dictates our behavior options, what we will look at and what we won't look at. So are you assigning an overwhelming meaning to situations that involve loss? That's a natural thing in the progression of grief, in recovering from grief, All right? There are certain stages where that's normal. Are you stuck at that stage because you are holding on to the meaning that somehow your life has been irrevocably damaged? What did the relationship mean to you and when that relationship can't exist in real terms we had Sean Leonard here to talk about life from the other side all right now Sean is the real deal all right in my opinion 
Not everybody has to believe that. But you know what? I'm not buying any wooden nickels in life. And what he says makes a whole lot more sense than to argue against science. It's also science-based, I believe. I'll stand up for it. You can't create energy. You can't destroy energy, but you can morph or change energy. All right. So wherever the energy is of the things or the people, and I've had a fair amount of loss in the last few years. All right. Wherever that energy is, you think it's dead? The body died. What meaning are you giving to the loss? And at what point does it make as much sense to stop and remember the power of that relationship that you miss? Whatever it is, your health, your job, your dog, your cat, your, your rabbit, your, your friend, your sister, your brother, your mother, your father, child. Just a minute, we have to meet somebody here. Okay. Um, honor the relationship. All right. And what it was worth. That is at least a piece of the truth. That's why you miss it. That's why I miss it. Okay, so moving along here. So as a clinical social worker, my working hypothesis is consistent with a point that was made in, as I did a little extra research here on this topic, I discovered that there was a study that was done in the American Journal, or it was listed in the American Journal of Psychiatry. It is possible that traumatic experiences or other environmental risk factors interact with particular genes, all right, to precipitate compulsive hoarding. And so that kind of is part of the genetic path. And I have often um, discovered as I'm working with people that it's only when the hoarding behavior set in that you could fully understand the importance of the risk factor. And maybe I'm not describing it as scientists would, but I've earned my right to describe it the way I see it. Sometimes it feels like hoarding behavior uh, for some people a fair number of people, is sort of like an opportunistic, I won't say virus, I will just say entity, behavior choice, that attaches when somebody becomes sufficiently vulnerable. Now, I also think, though, that when that happens, there probably was an unidentified vulnerability that you couldn't see, you couldn't understand, and you couldn't predict. But this study, um, I'll, if anybody's interested, I'll read it out to you. It's R-V-O-L-I-N-O -O at O. W L dot space two hundred two thousand and nine, and um, then the I guess the pages are eleven fifty nine. Whoops, a daisy! I jumped ahead of myself there. Give me a second. Uh, I jumped ahead here. We're gonna have a little work for. Sorry, just this would happen. Mm. 
Sorry, people. What I'll do is find my place um, and um, we will, um, I'll, I'll, I'll put it to you in the, um, the chat for the next podcast. This is embarrassing. What happened here? Okay, hold on a sec, people. I need to reboot. Oh, there we are. There we are. It was 1159 to 1160. That's R-V-O-L-I-N-O. -O. All right, 2009. All right. So some people who hoard have experienced loss and some haven't. So it isn't the loss that is the precipitating factor. It's the meaning um, that we apply to it and how long we hold on to the meaning. Sometimes the, debilita blah, the debilitating effect of the loss or setback is a measure of how significant it was personally. Sometimes a series of smaller losses, it doesn't have to be a major loss, but smaller losses occur within a, com a compressed period of time. And that compressed period of time and the number of times you've been incapacitated or derailed by it doesn't allow enough time in between to restabilize ourselves. So it doesn't, I mean, it makes sense that at a certain point, um, we get overwhelmed by whatever the challenge is, whatever the setback, whether it's loss or no, or anything. So loss might be part of the effect of setbacks. Um, it isn't necessarily the loss itself. And it's not necessarily the loss of a person. It could be the loss of a job. It could be the loss of health. It could be the loss of status. Um, could be could be loss of just about anything. All right. Remember the three paths to hoarding that we've talked about in prior podcasts. So rather than repeat them here, I'd like to refer you back to the webcast recording library. Go back and look at the podcast that covered the three paths to hoarding. All right. Because when you do that, have a particular look at the third path because I've seen people on path three okay who are not the most organized which is part of what path three is not the most organized and then becoming vulnerable so I can't tell you how many people over 22 years I have met who were chronically just enough, had to fight for organization. You wouldn't call them disorganized. You'd call them organized challenged, all right? And then they were made vulnerable by something or issues that were unresolved and unaddressed kind of got ahead of steam and took them out at the knees, all right? Those who are in that state of, we'll call it organized challenged, all right? when they become vulnerable, are at a higher risk of destabilizing. Here's the O word again. By becoming all together now, what is it? Thank you, Nora. I read lips. Overwhelmed, all right? Overwhelmed as a result of multiple small losses and or setbacks overwhelmed when you feel that starting all right what are your warning signs because going to overwhelmed is not a place you want to stay and if you find yourself there you fight like a son of a gun to get yourself out of it overwhelmed is not heading any place you want to be for very long reach out for the help you need all right so Individuals who are, we'll call them organized challenge, sometimes they report that there's a period of their life when things started to build up, all right? Items didn't get processed regularly. That's why I say, to the best of your ability, the work of today belongs to today, not tomorrow, because tomorrow will have its own work. 
And it doesn't take very long I, for that buildup of piggybacking the work to be insurmountable or feeling that way. A situation when that happens, that you resolve today's work today, all right, and tomorrow, the work of tomorrow belongs to tomorrow. If you don't do that very quickly, you can go on to create a hoarded environment. Okay? We can only deal with what we feel competent and adequately resources to resource to deal with. That's true for you, me, and everybody else. And the most successful people, those people who look like they've got it all, they're effective, and we look at them with respect, when we're overwhelmed, all right, and they're overwhelmed, it's not a very different experience. It's that they reach out for the lifeline. They know where it is. When they're falling out of the boat, they know where the life support um, jacket is. All right. They may keep it at hand. When we're overwhelmed, denial, and we don't do that. We don't engage in adequate self-care, healthy, appropriate self-care, according to what need we have right now. We're not coddling ourselves. That's not selfishness. Because if we don't do that, life is going to send you something. Nobody is exempt. When we're overwhelmed, you know what's a best friend? Denial distraction, and avoidance. To quote a former client of mine, Kathy, <clears throat> denial apparently is a well-known thing that is not just a river in Egypt. All right. I laughed when she told me that because we were talking about denial at the time. And common coping strategies um, can become a friend if you make them common. If you don't spot them for what they are, denial, distraction, or avoidance. And it will continue to go on long enough that the accumulation of whatever it is that's building up will feel insurmountable. And it can and often does become overwhelming. I think anybody who's overwhelmed, when you really have an honest look at it and you start deconstructing the path to it, you'll realize that there were points along the way that were an opportunity to shine a light, but you made a different choice. All right. That choice didn't lead you where you want to be. And I have to guarantee you this because I believe this most firmly. Having a little bit of courage at the time to ask yourself the tough question and give yourself an ability to sit with it and just let it become clearer, okay, is going to save you a whole whack and load of work of recovery. The work of recovery is so much harder. So I invite you, whatever happens today, sit with it, try to understand it and deal from your strengths. No matter how many answers you don't have, you always have the strengths you came to that situation with. And don't forget that. Never go to fear, go to fact and start with your strengths. All right, okay. So whether or not you hoard, when you first realize that you are becoming overwhelmed, reach out for the right help right away. It will be specific to whatever that situation is. You may need help about something very different than hoarding. Hoarding is something that's going to happen or has happened as a result of not dealing with this issue. All right. Especially help you trust to deal with the specific problem that is presenting a barrier and weighing you down. I am frankly honored and gratified that every week 
the number of people who take the time out of busy, complicated lives come uh, to this podcast. And my goal is to help you find and to the best of my ability, either share what I know or do some research uh, clinically to give you just the type of information and support and understanding so that you can respect yourself despite the challenges and that you don't lose hope, all right? You may be holding on to it hard. You may be fighting for hope, but hope is your right. Okay, so next week, um, unless something happens, um, the podcast, I will continue with the misconceptions, um, but it's going to be a recorded podcast rather than a live one, because I will be off-site working with um, the family who um, lost a family member, and they need to close down the estate, and it's complicated. So I'm going to be there. I will think of you. Uh, wish me luck and I wish you luck. And don't forget to put your reasons and the barriers that you most often choose or get stymied by in the chat box. All right. That will be very, very helpful um, to choosing material that will be most useful to you folks moving forward. Okay, let me just, we have five minutes. Let me just see what we have here in the chat. All right, go to the top. <laughs> Nora, to everyone, I literally forgot what's in the freezer. Out of sight, out of mind. It's true. There, that expression exists for good reason. It happens to many people, but we need to keep an eye on it. Okay. God, I get all kinds of books because I'm interested or someone gave them to me or I may need um, the information. However, I just don't have uh, the time to read all of that or I lose interest. So, Claude, um, books are like friends. They're also like holidays that we either don't have the time or can't afford to take. Um so they're kind of magic in that way. And they're very powerful for people. You said something here that is really interesting. And it has a cross item kind of application. And that is, you know, the books that aren't scintillating. Hmm? The information in those books, when you reach the point where you start not to really be interested, you lose interest, let them go. That's a sign that, you know what, they're not useful to you in this time frame. And that information with the right keyword searches, all right, that information is available bountifully on the internet. Good, bad, and, and, and indifferent, all right, information. And just because it's in a book doesn't mean it's great information. I really believe in um, researching. If it's a topic you want to know more about, researching on the internet, because you get all positions and you can compare what makes the most sense to you. And you know, there are key sources as well. Anytime I want medical information, I either go to the Mayo Clinic, Cincinnati Clinic, um, Sick Kids, whatever, whatever the, the topic is. There are respected sources and good information is generally held by the top drawer sources. So you don't have to be afraid of getting kind of drawn in um, to um, bad information. All right, so I'm going to uh, leave you now. I will uh, record the podcast and I will get it posted um, next week. And I wish you all the best week imaginable. Take care, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.
Have a good week too. You too. Bye, Chile. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Can you do it? Yes, you can. Yes, you can.